had with God the Father something to be held on to at all costs, but instead he made himself nothing. Kanao means to make oneself literally empty, but Paul never uses that way. He always uses it metaphorically. And so he makes himself nothing. And how does he do so? The amazing thing is it's not by ridding himself of anything, but by taking something on. By taking on the very form of a slave, there's Morphe again, by being made in human likeness. So what is the nature of the sons? Notice he says, he made himself. That's a reflective pronoun. This is something the son does. The son makes himself nothing by taking on human flesh. This is the great humiliation. He who has been worshipped by, by the angels in heaven, who was seen by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, worshipped by the seraphim, the cherubim, he takes on a human nature. He invades his own creation. And having entered into human existence, he humbled himself, again, something he does, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death one dies on a cross. Because of this, God the Father exalted him to the highest place and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that the mention of the exalted name of Jesus, everyone who is in heaven and on earth and under the earth bows the knee, and every tongue confesses Jesus Christ is kurios. The very same term used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament of the name of God, Yahweh. Jesus, the Messiah, is kurios. But notice, all to the glory of God the Father. The confession of of the exalted status of Jesus also results in the glory of God the Father. Now we have in these words clear indication of the pre-existence of the Son prior to the incarnation. Christian exegetes down through the centuries have understood the passage to refer to the period prior to the incarnation when the Son had equality with the Father in heaven itself. But oneness advocates say this passage refers to the time of Jesus' human ministry. If, in fact, the passage refers to the period before the incarnation of Christ, then it is plain that the Son preexisted as a person, was active and divine, and hence the debate is concluded for the Trinitarian position is established. Now remember, gave consideration, made himself of no reputation. These are acts of a person, not acts of a plan. If the son could consider his relationship with the father and in light of that not hold on to that equality he had but voluntarily lay it aside so as to take on a human nature. Isn't that exactly what Paul is telling the Christians to do? Don't look to your own things. Yes, you have equal rights, but lay them aside in the service of others. You want the greatest example of that? Look at the son who is eternally equal with the Father, and yet, for the glory of the triune God and the service of us, believe it or not, he lays aside those rights that are his, he enters into human existence, and he becomes obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. I also point out to you, the one who became obedient to the point of death is the one who had equality with the Father. That means this is clearly before the incarnation. The verbs tell the story. Have this attitude that was also in Christ Jesus, who although he eternally existed, not just as a plan, but he truly existed in the very form of God, did not consider action of a human, uh, action of a person, that equality had with God the Father something to be held on to at all costs, but instead he made himself nothing, action of a person, by entering into human flesh, that's the incarnation, by being made in the likeness of men. The verbs tell the story, this one was preexistent and active as a person. This is clearly what is being said. Syntactically, Paul presents two verbal clauses separated by the, by the adversative but, a law in verse 7. The actions of existing and consider equality go together. This is important since to consider is the action of a person. The key verb is made himself nothing. The possession of equality took place before the emptying. Taking the form of a servant describes the means of the made himself nothing as does being made in human likeness. Jesus was made in the likeness of men, not on the night of his betrayal when he serves the apostles or at any other point. 
He is made in the likeness of men at the incarnation, not at a time later in his ministry. Therefore, this passage teaches the deity of Christ, he existed in the form of God, as well as the distinct personhood of the Son prior to the incarnation. The Son, as the Son, distinguishable from the Father, has eternally existed as a divine person. There is the first text that we will need to look at very, very carefully this evening. The next text we will need to look at, John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We will be focusing upon verse 5. Obviously, all of John 17, from my perspective, is vitally important in the oneness debate. For I truly believe that the prayers of Jesus are one of the greatest stumbling blocks that stands in the way of anyone accepting as biblical oneness teaching. The idea that in the prayers of Jesus, this is an internal conversation within one person who's actually two persons, so that the human side is praying to the divine side, simply doesn't work because in these prayers, Jesus not only refers to his preexistence, but he refers to himself in terminology that can only be in reference to deity. But if he's praying, then it's the human side, which is non-deity, that is doing the praying. And hence, the prayers of Jesus have truly been, I think, the greatest refutation down through history of all forms of modalism in their anti-Trinitarian expression. John chapter 17, verses 3 through 5 say, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I simply suggest to you before we look any more closely at the text that in any normative human language, any normative human language, that text presents one person speaking to another person. I don't think there's any question about it at all. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God. So he's referring to the deity. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, well, to have eternal life is to know two persons? Yes, two persons. But Jesus Christ is distinguished because he's the one speaking, and he is sent. And he says, you have sent. Then I glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now he identifies who he's referring to specifically. Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In any normative human language, that is one person making reference to another person. Now, look at the text even more closely. Given the personal pronouns, there is no question that these are the words of one person speaking to another person. You have direct address, Father. Me, the person speaking, recognizes his own personhood. Yourself recognizes the personhood of the Father, the glory which I had with you before the world was. He's talking about a period of time where the Father and the Son existed together, and it's before the world was. Same time period we saw in the Carmen Christi. Together with yourself, a truly divine glory. Glorify me. If, if, if this is just a human nature speaking, then can human natures request?